interesting observation to keep before us is that even greater than God's creation is his plan for our redemption. There's only one book focusing on creation specifically, the book of Genesis. There are many books in the scripture that focus on his plan for our redemption. Exodus, of course, being the, the opening one, and Revelation, of course, being the climactic one with Ruth and Joshua and others between that really focus on God's highest mission on our behalf. Not our creation, but rather our redemption. And that's what Exodus is all about. We've uh, spent most of the time in the first six chapters, which deal with the deliverer, one Moses, called of God to perform the role of the deliverer, his deliverer. And we uh, now enter the next six, which are specifically the chapters of redemption. We started last time by a brief introduction to chapter 7, but we can just start from chapter 7, verse 1, and carry it forward. The Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. And we could spend a lot of time studying, by the way, this concept of all that I command thee. There is no toned down uh, message here. It, we can find many emphases in the scripture uh, to deal with his entire message. 2 Timothy 4, 3, 1, 13, 1 Timothy 6, 3, and 4 are places that one could dig into that issue. In any case, thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, and he shall send the children of Israel out of his land, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Very interesting to keep before us the notion that God had promised, even back to Abraham in Genesis, but certainly in his commission to Moses, that he would be initially unsuccessful. Why? Well, for many reasons, not the least of which is to give God an opportunity to accomplish his mission on our behalf, to show himself strong, to demonstrate to all the nations what he was all about. But God tells Moses here uh, that uh, they're not going to be successful, that is, in terms of changing Pharaoh's mind initially. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And it's my proposition to you tonight to consider the possibility that those judgments had far more implications in God's plan than simply bringing Egypt to its knees and extricating his people from Egypt. I'm going to suggest to you a variety of ways that those specific ten judgments have implications for all of the universe far beyond the wildest imaginations of Pharaoh and the Egyptians and what have you. By great judgments, verse 4, verse 5, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. The Egyptians had to learn the hard way. Hopefully most of us in this room will learn the easy way. It's terrifying to consider the fact that some people in this room may learn the hard way the same way the Egyptians did. They shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 6, And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord had commanded them, so did they. Verse 7, And Moses was fourscore years old, when, and Aaron fourscore and three years old, when they spoke unto Pharaoh. And that's about as far as we got last time, I believe. We might uh, make a few comments before getting into the specific action, if you will. Uh, one thing we're going to discover as we watch in this area, you'll notice that Moses' style has totally changed. We remember Moses as being timid, frightened, saying, I'm of slow speech and of slow tongue, and so forth. We're not going to see that Moses here. We're going to see him strong. We are reminded, perhaps, of the incredible transformation of Peter all through the Gospels. Peter is the one guy that seems to be afflicted with foot and mouth disease. He's always the guy that speaks too quickly and ends up being the foil, if you will, for some rise of explanation of what the real spiritual significance was in a situation. We could recount many of those. And Peter's lovable, impulsive, but certainly not exactly what you'd consider polished. And uh, one, in fact, is fascinated that, of all things, Peter stumbles by a lack of courage. But in Acts, chapter 2 on, in chapter 3, we see Peter deliver several sermons, and they are a remarkable contrast with the Peter we know in the Gospels. What happened between the end of the Gospels and the beginning of Acts? 
Holy Spirit. And we can actually see the transformation in his life if you study the messages of Peter, both before and after. Very interesting. I think we can conclude something analogous. I don't want to get into the theology of that here, but certainly something interesting happens to Moses because we're going to see a different Moses uh, unfold here. We're going to see, of course, in this conflict between God and Egypt, the conflict between good and evil in far broader terms than simply the relief of an oppressive administration in North Africa many thousands of years ago, some 3,500 in rough terms. There's far more at stake here than simply the issue of slavery and freedom. Far more issue here than simply some nationalistic focus. We're going to see here a foreshadowing, if you will, of the fundamental conflict between good and evil. The model of the world is what Egypt really represents. Egypt is the world. Pharaoh is a model of Satan. You notice his heart is hardened. Uh, hardened. And you can contrast that, if you will, to your studies of the origin of Lucifer, Satan, what have you, in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, those of you that are interested in that subject. And uh, you can study our notes on Revelation chapter 12, which describes the, the mission and ambition and uh, strategy of the red dragon in Revelation 12, the one that we know by many names, but Satan perhaps being the, the most common. We're going to see in this narrative the absolute triumph of God. Nothing conditional or marginal or partial here. We're going to see him redeem his people, and we're going to see the utter overthrow of his enemies. And I put that in focus right up front, because we'll talk about that at the end uh, in terms of how this is a prophetic study. We're obviously going to take a look at the specifics here, but our focus will be prophetic. A couple of other comments I might mention. We're going to see both here, we've already seen, we've seen here recently, and we're going to see more of this issue of the hardening of the heart. Uh, there is a case in the Old Testament. Sihon, the king of Heshbon, was described in Deuteronomy 2.30 and Numbers 21, uh, verses 21, 22, and 23, as being hardened by the Lord. And also in Joshua chapter 11, verses 19 and 20, we see the Hivites spoken of this way. We're reminded in Romans 9, chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 18, where Paul reminds us that whom he will, he hardens. That's a strange idea. It's a New Testament idea. It's not some quaint Old Testament thing. Uh, let's always be on our guard. So many scholars, so many books speak of the God of the Old Testament in contrast to the God of the New. Nonsense. Yesterday, today, the same forever, right? God does not change. Our understanding of how he is dealing with people is the critical issue here. The character of God is what we're trying to understand. And we see the climax of his character in none other than Jesus Christ. Don't fall into the trap of assuming that our concept of God or God himself somehow has changed between the Old and New Testament. I think we also made reference last time to Matthew 18, verse 7, where it says that, uh, Matthew 18, verse 7, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Very important principle all through Scripture. The classic example that scholars love to address is Judas. Yes, he betrayed Christ. Yes, it was prophesied that he would in the Psalms some eight centuries before Christ was born. Was he accountable? Yes, he was. But it was prophesied that he would. That's right. And you get this whole thing of fate versus free will. It's free will on our side of the time domain. It looks fatalistic if you recognize God knows ahead of time what you're going to do. But that doesn't relieve you of the responsibility for having done it. If I tell my kids not to reach in the cookie jar while I'm gone, and I discover that when I get back they did, the fact that I knew they would doesn't relieve them from their responsibility for not having to, to not do it, right? We're in the same boat. This fate versus free will argument is only one where you don't have a model of what I call the time transform, that is from the time domain, which is a physical dimensionality we're in, versus the absence of the physical dimensionality that God enjoys, which says he is outside the time domain altogether. And that's a whole other thing. But anyway, uh, woe unto that man by whom the offense cometh. Therefore was Pharaoh relieved of any responsibility because God hardened his heart. Hardly. You'll excuse the pun. We find that hearts are hardened by the Lord in chapter 4, verse 21, verse uh, 3 here in chapter 7, verse 13 we're going to come to. And this is also perhaps useful to turn to Revelation 17, 17. We're going to draw tonight many parallels between the book of Exodus and the book of Revelation. Let's not fail to note that even in this regard, 
If we look at Revelation chapter 17, it happens to deal with this great mystery, mystery Babylon and so forth. Verse 17 of chapter 17 points out that for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. Now he, of course, is referring to the disciples here, right? He's referring to his missionaries, right? Who is he referring to here? His enemies. And yet God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Fascinating that the very rise of satanic powers is in concert with God's will and do so to bring his name glory. It's a strange idea, something we might keep in focus. Well, let's jump in. We're, we're going to try and cover, if we can, nine of the ten plagues tonight. We're going to set aside the tenth because it deserves special mention. The reason it does is that while we're going to have at least two chapters devoted to the tenth plague, and I might argue the entire New Testament in a sense. So we'll just take nine, if you will. There's an incident that occurs a little bit ahead of this before we get into the uh, plagues as they're classically thought of. Pick it up, verse 8. The Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. And up till now, Moses is feeling pretty comfortable, going right on schedule, until verse 11. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. Now many people, many scholars, like to believe or like to take the view that this was chicanery or, or uh, sleight of hand or a conjurer's trick something, some clever theatrical gimmick they indulged in here. Before we finish this chapter, I won't take the time now because it'll distract us, but before we finish this chapter, I'm going to suggest to you that, that this word means exactly what it says. It's, they did in like manner with their enchantments. Somehow, these characters did magic. I mean, magic not as a show or an illusion, but something supernatural. That may shock us to say, gee, are you saying that something like that was going on in those days? Yes. Why is it important to us? Because that's what's going on these days. And furthermore, will be a major sign of authority by our adversary. And as thus pointed out in the New Testament, especially in the book of Revelation, but even in the Gospels. So we want to be alert to that. Verse 12, for they cast down every man his rod. How many men were there? doesn't say how many does it. It just says plural, right? How many men cast down their rods? Two. We know that from Second Timothy. We'll look that up shortly. There were two. They cast down every man his rod, and they became servants. And Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And he, that is the Lord, hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. This brief incident is commented on by Paul in his second letter to Timothy. It might be worth taking a look at. Second Timothy... 3.8. It's very interesting how the most reliable commentary on the scripture is the scripture itself. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Paul is talking to Timothy. He's making reference to this incident in the book of Exodus. Somehow Paul knows their names, these two magicians of Pharaoh. But I want you to notice how he describes them. They withstood Moses. Now that's kind of interesting. We could read that passage very, very quickly. And if we were sensitive, we'd recognize, yes, that refers to them withstanding Moses, who is Janus and Jambres, the two magicians that are referenced in the book of Exodus. Fine. What do you mean they withstood Moses? We get a great insight here as to the ambition and goal of the one that is their commander. I can think of that in the model sense of Pharaoh, or I can think of it in the spiritual sense, meaning Satan. What was his goal? That they withstand Moses. How do they withstand Moses? By imitation. By imitation. Now, you all may recall our Lord's instruction to his disciples in Matthew chapter 13. He gave the disciples seven kingdom parables, as we call them. We study those in great depth for a variety of reasons, but do you remember the parable of the tares and the wheat? 
The field, of course, is the world in all those parables. Everyone's consistent. The seed that he sows is what? The word of God. And it falls on four different kinds of soils. And there's a whole thing about the rocky ground and the good earth and so forth. The second parable is a, another parable, which is like a sower who sowed a seed. And then the enemy came and sowed what? Tares, which, when they're young, look like the wheat. And the men that served the householder were going to go out and pull up the tares. He says, don't do it. You can't tell until later which is which and so forth. And you know the parable. But notice the ambition of the enemy is to create a counterfeit, to create a counterfeit. What do they do before Pharaoh? They create also serpents, just like Moses did. God has the supremacy because the serpent that was out of Aaron's rod swallowed the other two. Strange thing. One thing that it does not record is that the Pharaoh's magicians could return the serpent back into a rod. And some scholars make a big thing of that. One of the interesting things is that the rod that Aaron had returns to a rod, so he's in control. This idea that Satan can do miracles bothers a lot of people. But that is something that you might indeed be alert to. If I somehow up here tonight raised somebody from the dead, would you be impressed? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but there's only one question you should really ask. By whose authority and who gets the glory? You should not be shocked if I raised someone from the dead and gave the glory to somebody other than Jesus Christ. I mean, you'd be shocked because you know me, maybe, but the point is that some of you who know me well say wouldn't be shocked. But, you know, the point is, the point is, that the issue isn't the event of a supernatural, you know, is a supernatural event. The issue is, is it of a form that gives glory to Jesus Christ? If it's a form that gives glory to any other, shun it. If I was Satan's minister, don't expect me to give the glory to Satan. Expect me to give the glory to anything that is acceptable to you other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Because my goal is imitation. My goal is deceit. Not direct confrontation, necessarily. If I was going to espouse some false doctrine, if there was some idea that would destroy your path of growth before the Lord Jesus Christ, what better way for me to derail you from a path of growth is to have some miracle occur, a healing, especially something that is really, really acceptable socially and ascribe that to some variation of sound doctrine. That's the way I rip you off. If I was up here and healed a lame person in the name of Satan, you'd be on your guard. You might be startled at the effect, but I would probably not injure your spiritual growth. In fact, I might even do great, give you great leaps of commitment by doing that. <laughs> to be confronted with an exorcism or something like that is a, can have a, a very interesting uh, result. If I was going to rip you off, and I was shrewd, and don't kid yourself, Satan is, I would do a miracle in the name of some God that I think you could embrace that's just deviation enough from the truth is to get you in trouble. If you're a navigator at sea and I want to throw you off, all I have to do is nudge that compass one degree, and sooner or later you'll be far enough off to be in real trouble. Remember, Satan's goal isn't necessarily direct confrontation. And in fact, most of the time we encounter in the scripture, his goal is the counterfeit, the imitation. Even in Revelation, the raising from the dead, the beast that had the head wound and did live, the counterfeit resurrection, the satanic trinity with Satan and the false prophet and the, and the whole thing. It's all imitation. And likewise, we see it here. Do you notice how many witnesses Pharaoh has? We're going to find that God has two witnesses, Moses and Aaron, and that may be a model after Revelation 11, where in fact we will see two witnesses very prominently again, and the two witnesses in Revelation 11 do the same miracles. Correction, now they do four different miracles, two of which Moses did, two of which Elijah did. And, and for those of you that are into that whole thing, I, I'm one of these nuts that believes Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses. And if you're interested in that, I don't insist upon it. It's just a view that I have, but I might as well let the cat out of the bag. If you're interested in that, get the tapes on Revelation 11, and we go into all that, why that view. And if it, most people like to say Enoch for some other reasons, I don't get into here, but there are a lot of views, and probably all of us are wrong as something else different. But in any case, from, from a scriptural perspective, I tend to see uh, Moses certainly as one of those two guys. And uh, if so, it's kind of interesting 
keep that in mind as we see Moses going here. Now Moses does, I don't think at this point, know all that. I think that was revealed to him after the Lord put him on the bench from blowing it at Meribah. And uh, <laughs> it's very interesting that Moses is one that got himself buried and, and uh, uh, yet uh, we find Satan and Michael fighting over his body when we read Jude and that sort of causes us to ponder what's going on. We'll take that up later. Anyway, two witnesses. Uh, Moses may be one of them. I think I made it before I got off the subject here all the way to verse 13. Let's jump to verse 14. The Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Get the end of Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out into the water. We generally assume from a variety of sources that there was a ceremonial event going here. He wasn't just going down to dip his feet in the water. There was some ceremonial opportunity. But in any case, Lo, he goeth out into the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's brink to meet him, and the rod which is turned into a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness, and behold, hitherto thou wouldst not hear. That's a very direct way for Moses to confront the known ruler of the entire earth at that time, i.e. Pharaoh. It's not a casual petition, it's virtually a command. Verse 70, Thus saith the Lord, In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in thine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch forth thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon the streams, upon the rivers, upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood. And that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Now that's interesting. Even the water that's in vessels. You open the icebox, there's a jar of water. It's turned to blood. Now, I might mention, those of you that are fond of extracurricular reading, if you've never encountered the works of Emanuel Velikovsky, a very interesting guy, quite a scholar, wrote a series of books, but the one that became the most famous is Worlds in Collision. He published this in about 1951, I believe. <clears throat> Unfortunately, at that same year, there was a science fiction story published World, When Worlds Collide, which has got nothing to do with this book, and many people get the two confused. But he wrote this book, and it's actually a study, a very, very comprehensive study, of the possibility that a comet passed near the Earth and it was recently enough in the memory of the earth that the event was recorded, not only on the events of the earth, but in the memories of man. And he attributes the plagues of Egypt to the events of that comet passing. Now, it's an interesting book. I'm not here to, oh, by the way, when it came out, it was discredited. Scientists thought he was nuts. He was just a crackpot writer, what have you. He wrote several other books on similar kinds of subjects. In relatively recent years, there's a surprising groundswell of acceptance by many, many scientists of Vilikovsky's concepts, even some NASA guys. The point being that this comet returned after a period of time and ended up being one of our naked eye planets, either Venus or Mars. What, this, what gets, makes this interesting is there are ba Babylonian inscriptions of naked eye planets that omit Venus. Venus as a comet may have been given rise to calf worship with the horns and so forth. He goes into the long day of Joshua, which comes later. The incredible research he's done, he digs out that in China that there's a legend of the long night. And it's an interesting book. I'm not suggesting he's correct. I'm just suggesting it's interesting background reading. He's not a believer. He attempts to explain uh, these legends and beliefs that are widespread throughout the earth in very many forms that go back to he believes that they evidence a chaos that the earth experienced. And he attributes the plagues of the, of the uh, exodus to these natural causes. Now, frankly, it's very interesting reading if you like that sort of thing. It's quite scholastic, so you want to be a fairly serious student to get into this. But on the other hand, he's also not a believer, and he tries to ascribe the plagues to natural causes. Now, frankly, he has a tough time explaining how a certain kind of dust that might have been kicked up by this thing in the air caused the water to turn red. It's very difficult to have that occur in sealed jars. He goes into all this and tries to deal with it. He really has a tough time, in my opinion, trying to explain how the death of the firstborn occurred by natural causes. You know. <laughs> I frankly think I could harness a great deal of technology today and go through this audience and try to guess which one of you are a firstborn. 
So he has a way of trying to deal with that. It's interesting background reading. Don't misunderstand. I'm not endorsing the book, nor am I uh, suggesting that's appropriate in the field of apologetics because he's just an interesting writer. But he is that's that, an interesting writer. And those of you that have never acquainted yourself with his writings might find him interesting fireside reading. There was no pun intended there either. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So we're down to verse 20, and more, Moses and Aaron did so, and the Lord, as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river and in the sight of Pharaoh and the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood, and the fish that were in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, I want you to notice something. The Nile River was worshipped by the Egyptians as part of their cultural background. The Nile was a god they worshipped. It was the source of life to them. And what is the first place that God judges? The river. But something else, notice verse 22, And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. And the Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and neither did he set his heart to this also. And all the Egyptians digged round about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. And seven days were fulfilled after the Lord had smitten the river. Apparently, not much elaboration here, somehow the magicians also accomplished the same thing. Apparently they got the water that was uncontaminated, apparently by digging around the river, but that water they also were able to contaminate. What's not clear to me is how they could, by also making the water turn to blood, convince Pharaoh that the water was turning to blood by their enchantments as opposed to Moses's. That's not clear. We just have to rely on the scripture. I frankly have a tough time picturing how they would, you know, if all the water's turning to blood and I say, here, here's my water, look, it's turning to blood too. You know, I, I'm not sure how I would get my, my card punched on that one. <laughs> We're going to see, though, that three things the magicians were able to accomplish, and then something strange happens. And we'll take that up when we get there. But before we leave this river, another comment I'll make. There's another place where God uses water to judge the earth. Noah, remember Genesis 6 and 7 and so forth. If you study Genesis 7 verse 10, you discover a week went by there also. In a, what might be a, a meaningful way. From here, we could take a digression and go into Revelation where water is turned to blood. That's prominent enough in Revelation. I don't think we have to deal in that uh, in great effort. Water in the New Testament symbolically means what? The word. In the tabernacle, we're going to discover later, there's a laver to wash, just as Paul talks in Ephesians, but washing of the water by the word. And uh, what we wash, what is used for washing in uh, the tabernacle is the glassy sea that we stand on in heaven. D uh, John in Revelation chapter 5 is standing on the glassy sea. What we wash here on earth with, we stand on there. There's a pun, a deliberate pun by the Holy Spirit, again, speaking of his word. The Nile was the water they worshipped. It has turned into death, into blood. Let's keep moving on. I think I'll go through the specific plagues atomistically, uh, piece by piece. And then we'll try to come back and put them all into perspective, okay? Chapter 8, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. Yeah. And the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, and over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt, and Aaron stretched out his hand upon the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. A hideous thing. Now, it's repulsive because frogs are puffy, unclean <laughs> night creatures. Okay, so we look at this and we sort of, the idea of being infested by a plague of frogs is unappealing to us. Egypt worshipped the frog. If you study Egyptology and you discover the various gods they worship, there were many of them. Frogs are among them. Notice verse 7. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. So the magicians were able to simulate this one. By the way, don't feel this is going to get habit forming. They have a lot of trouble with the later ones. 
It's interesting that the magician could increase the frogs, it couldn't make them go away. It's a very important point, by the way, because the context here implies that this was a nuisance. They were so voluminous that this was not a blessing, because they worship frogs, get a lot of frogs, huh? These were a nuisance, okay? And the prevalence of these frogs is what, if Pharaoh had his choice, he would obviously, he would rebut Moses by making them go away. The magicians were not able to do that. It's a very, very important point. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. Surprise. Pharaoh says, Okay, I've changed my mind. The frogs were enough. You can go now. Moses said unto Pharaoh, I want it in writing. No, no. He says, Moses said unto Pharaoh, Command me when I shall entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses that they may remain in the river only. And he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee and from thy houses and from thy servants and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps. And in the quaint King James, and the land stank. <laughs> and when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. In other words, he changed his mind. Now, I won't comment on frogs more than I have. They were worshipped by the Egyptians. We notice in Revelation 16, 13, we might just pop to Revelation 16, 13, because it's probably a good time to do that. Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come up out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of what? Devils, Devils or demons, more precisely. Working miracles. Oh, really? In the book of Revelation, we expect these unclean spirits, which are reckoned in Revelation as frogs, to help us identify what God is talking about here, do miracles. And they go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Then there's a little promise stuck in here. Behold, I come as a thief, and so forth. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see a shame. And then it picks up the thought again, verse 16, he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Har Megiddo, Mount Megiddo. Let me take one more, and then we'll, take a, we'll try to recap here a little bit. Up till now, the uh, magicians have been able to simulate. They simulate they, I mean, that is, they've been able to create serpents, they've been able to make water into blood, and they have been able to call up frogs. We get to the next, the fourth event, or the third plague, if you will, verse 16. The Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. That's a lot of lice. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice. But guess what? They could not. Now, if this was a conjurer's trick, if there was some up till now at the context of the writer or the scripture was that they were simply creating simulations of these things or were able to just create the impression that they were able to do these things, verse 18 and 19 wouldn't be written the way they are. You notice they could not, okay? So there were lights upon man and beast, and the magicians said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Now, there's something about lice that freaked them out. The blood and the water, they could deal with. I mean, they, they dealt with that. They did their supernatural, they, they matched his power with theirs, and they could maintain a position. When the frogs came, they could call up frogs. That somehow was some kind of capability they had. When they get to the lice, they not only can't do it, they do a very strange thing. They go to Pharaoh and say, hey, we're in trouble. This is the finger of God. Why? What's unique about lice? Well, it turns out, to get a little bit of insight, Herodotus gives us a clue. The priests of the Egyptian system had 
a big thing about cleanliness. They wore special linen garments. They shaved their head every third day. In order for them to worship according to their system, they had to be totally clean. They were, they were really big on that. The infestation of the lice made it impossible for them to worship. The priests themselves could not officiate in accordance with the system that they were following. And the bringing of the lice against them was something that they recognized themselves. God was dealing with them. While it may seem obscure to us, the scripture does record that they recognized what God was doing. And they went to Pharaoh and said, hey, this is the finger of God. A couple of other things that you might notice, just to see if you're aware. In this last plague, you notice the lice, is the Lord, verse 16, the Lord said unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the ground. Do you notice what's missing in this third plague? We had the, we had the, blood, the, the water turned to blood, we had the frogs, now we have the lice. Do you notice something that's missing with this third plague? In the previous cases, Moses went to Pharaoh and says, hey, if you, if you don't let my people go, you're going to have water turned to blood. Or you're going to have frogs come out everywhere. In the third one, he doesn't get a warning, he just does it. We're going to discover as we go through that of the nine plagues, I'm going to set the tenth aside as a special case because that's a very, very special case. But in, they are divided in groups of three. And this is the kind of thing that if you're a really serious student of the Word, you can make charts and study it and see if there's, a, if there's an insight here. But we'll discover that in Greek, the groups of three are clustered by a variety of structural techniques. One of them is that there's a warning, a warning, and then no warning. When you go to plagues 4, 5, and 6, there's a warning and a warning, then no warning. When you go to 7, 8, and 9, there's a warning, a warning, no warning. The same kind of thing that the Lord does in the seven letters, seven churches. We know from the structure of the letters, certain letters don't follow the structure, and there are clues in that as to some of the meaning of the letters. There's something else that's kind of interesting. In the first three plagues, Aaron's rod is specifically the instrumentality. In the middle three plagues, it's not mentioned. In the last three plagues, Moses himself is the agency, not Aaron. The ninth one, it doesn't mention his rod. It says, stretch forth his hand. And the rod isn't actually mentioned. And that, in a sense, breaks that pattern. So that means the pattern may not be meaningful, or it may mean just a translational problem of some kind, or maybe something else. I'll leave that for your own study, and let's see how the Holy Spirit deals with you on that. Something else that's clear is that there is a progression of these plagues. The first few really, the first three, really attack simply the comfort of the Egyptians. The water is a little more serious than that, but we don't get the impression that it went, got so bad that they died. Do you with me? It symbolized death, but it was for seven days. It reattacks their comfort. The next three plagues attacks their possessions. And the last three plagues actually result in death and destruction. There's a progressive effect, if you will. Aaron is the agency early, Moses the agency later. Okay, that, uh, one other thing, it's very interesting to see the magicians testify to the power of God. The magicians make this declaration, this is the finger of God, and they promptly leave the stage and we never see them again. We will see no mention of the magicians after that verse, verse 19. Something else that's kind of interesting, where did the lice come from? The dust. When we turn to John 8, you recall when the enemies of Christ tried to trap him with the woman taken adultery? How did he deal with his enemies? He wrote in the dust. Whose finger was doing the writing? Christ's finger. But that's another, the finger of God, may I suggest. Okay. Now you can run with that on your own if you like to see if there's other analogies between that and this situation. But let's, uh, rest of us will move on. Verse 20. The Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. There's a warning here, right? Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and unto thy houses, and of the houses of the Egyptians, shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are. So now we have the next plague, the plague of flies. Who is the Lord of the flies? 
Beelzebub means the Lord of the Flies. Beelzebub is a title of whom? Satan, Satan or certainly his, uh, his, uh, his key leaders. Okay, let's move on. There's something else that takes place here. Another change takes place. The magicians are out of the way. Up till now, all of Egypt was affected. All of Egypt was affected by the water. We have no reason to believe any other way. The um, frogs were everywhere, and the lice were everywhere, right? But when we get to the flies, something else is introduced here. Verse 22, and I will set apart in that day the land of Goshen. Now we know, know from Genesis, where was the most favorable part of the country? Goshen. Goshen was originally given to Joseph for his family as a gift from Pharaoh. It was a big deal. It was a positive thing. It was the uh, deluxe location. It thus became the Sencroy, the primary area where the Hebrew slaves thus grow and multiply. So it's the residence of the Hebrew slaves. Notice what God says here. I will, I'll set apart in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there to the end that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and thy people, and tomorrow shall this sign be. And the Lord did so, and there became a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. Now we might find it interesting to look at Psalm 78. Verse 44, he turned their streams into blood and the streams that they could not drink. Verse 45, he sent various sorts of flies among them which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave also the increase to the caterpillar and their labor into the locust and on he goes. The point is in verse 45, it says he sent various sorts of flies. There's a ver what many translators uh, point out is that what we think of flies, we think of it in a very narrow way. The concept here may be broader of all kinds of insects. Small point, but... The real point I'm trying to make is you're not limited in terms of your insight into Exodus by the Torah alone. The Psalms, the New Testament, and so forth ends up often giving you a little bit of an insight. So there's all kinds of scholars that spend a lot of time wondering what kind of fly it was, etc. Um, if they read the Psalms, they'd know that there's apparently a variety. So small point, but I thought I'd throw that out. The main thing that intrigues me here is that this is the first plague where God now starts to set aside Israel as a special exception. That has to freak the Pharaoh out. It's one thing to have these swarms of, of things coming, and you could easily visualize that Pharaoh probably began to believe that Moses didn't cause them, he just had somehow an advance warning. By some way, uh, Moses knew they were coming and grandstanded it. The analogy you often think of, or I think of sometimes, is the, in Mark Twain's famous story about Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, where he's ready to be sentenced to death, and he knows from his almanac that an eclipse is supposed to happen that day, and he, he takes advantage of it and impresses them all, of course, by calling for the eclipse, and the eclipse happens, and so forth, and Mark Twain plays upon that time warp idea. Again, though, taking advantage of it, you know, not that he made it happen, he just knew it was coming, but had, it had the same practical effect, okay? And um, I'm also reminded of the Stonehenge, in uh, England, uh, out on the Salisbury Plain. We know from archaeological evidence that that was built in three phases over about a 300-year period, this huge, huge stone structure. And of course, under Gerald Hawkins' leadership some years ago, they also discovered that it was a predictor of all the major sun and moon positions, astronomically. And they also had these 56 Aubrey holes around it, after the guy that first discovered them. And um, they are filled with human cremations, by the way, apparently. But the point is that it predicts eclipses. And it was, it's within one mile of latitude on the planet Earth where that can happen. And it does this with a great accuracy. And the, the, the Stonehenge thing, of course, you can only imagine a, a, a Bronze Age people trying to control a priesthood that could predict eclipses, what it could do to a culture. And it could predict this uh, very accurately. It made an error once every 300 years. I'm always fascinated by the fact that they had the monument for about 300 years before it was abandoned. So you sort of wonder what that last time was like. <laughs> Um, anyway, it's one thing for Pharaoh to assume that Moses was simply predicting, but when the Lord now puts a division between the Egyptians and the Hebrews, the Egyptians are afflicted, the Hebrews are not, that's got to be an unnerving report to get from your intelligence sources, that the Hebrews aren't bothered, it's just us. That's got to start bothering Pharaoh. 
Verse 25, and Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron. He said, go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. Moses said, it is not proper so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? Now, you may be wondering what's going on in Genesis. You'll discover that shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. Part of their thing was to consider shepherdry and certainly the offering of a lamb an abomination. And that's what they're going to do. And Moses is saying, do you want to do that before your eyes or do you want to send us out three days' journey like we asked for? Verse 27, we will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God, and he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away and treat for me. Pharaoh is trying to compromise. Okay, you can go, but don't go three days away. Just don't go that far away. I'll let you go. I'll let you sacrifice and do your thing, but not quite all the way. God will say that to you, too. He'll ask you to do something, and I should say, you may say that to him. Well, I'll go almost all the way. Like Abraham, I won't go, you know, I'll leave Ur of the Chaldees, and I'll go up river a bit. I'm not going to go, the, I'll just go up to Haran, up river a bit. How many of us are that way? We haven't gone three days' journey in the wilderness. We haven't gone on to resurrection ground. All we've done is sort of maybe move away a little bit. It's a token effort. Don't, do, you shall not go very far away. Entreat for me, Pharaoh says. Verse 29, And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated for the Lord. The Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. At this time, neither would he let the people go. Did God really accept the compromise? No, not really. He knows Pharaoh is going to re renege, and he's got a few more on his schedule. Okay? A few more of these things on his schedule. Well, let's just keep going. Uh, chapter 9, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go, and will hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, and upon thy horses, and upon thy asses, and upon the camels, and upon the oxen, and upon the sheep. There shall be a very grievous plague. And the Lord shall separate between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. And there shall nothing die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the next day, and all the cattle of Egypt died, and of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened that he did not let the people go. You know, we look at him, and we almost have to express amazement that this guy, after seeing all this, could be that stubborn. Many people react when, the, you know, the, the movie, The Ten Commandments, was popular, and many people see that movie, and they just could not get over, could not get over how this people, especially after all those miracles, they go out in the wilderness, then they, you know, they, they fall away again. You see all, you know, the, the incredible things that God did with them, and yet we just get amazed at Pharaoh's stubbornness on the one hand, the Israelites' subsequent unbelief on the other. And yet as we do that, I wonder how many of us are even in a more embarrassing predicament than they were. Because we have all of this plus long, long lists. Not the least of which is the giving of Jesus Christ himself. And we wonder just how, how stubborn can man be? How headstrong, how hardened can his heart be as to not recognize what God is trying to say to each one of us? Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward heaven in the sight of Pharaoh, and it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and there shall be a boil breaking forth with ulcers upon man, upon beast, throughout all the land of Egypt. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with ulcers upon man, upon beast. And the magi magicians could not stand before Moses because of all the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. I beg your pardon, I guess the magicians are mentioned one more time here. And the Lord uh, hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Oh, there are some scholars that believe that the furnace refers here to, the, to an altar to Typhon, 
which was a embodiment of a basic evil principle, and uh, it uh, involved human sacrifice, just as a background item. So the ashes they're throwing may have maybe there more than uh, m more maybe meant there than we're probably giving uh, recognition to just by a quick reading of it. Verse 13, the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up to show in thee my power. That's a heavy trip to have God say that to Pharaoh. That my name be declared throughout all the earth. As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go? Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. To get a little bit of perspective of this, perhaps, you should recognize that the Egyptian was taught that Egypt's origin was at the creation of the world, and that Pharaoh was the divinely appointed ruler. Their whole world centered around Egypt, the Nile, their various gods in which Pharaoh was the leader. He was considered a god. And they were taught that for generations. That was their whole mentality. We look at that sort of quaint, and we have a hard time embracing that idea. But you need to recognize their association with their culture and with Pharaoh, with their own creation. Now there's a hail. Send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, and hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses, and he that regardeth not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man, upon beast, upon the herb of the field, throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran along upon the ground. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So there was hail, and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt, since it became a nation. And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that were in the field, both man and beast. And the hail smote every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. I can't visualize Yul Brenner saying that, but anyway. <laughs> Verse 28. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not yet fear the Lord God. And the flax and the barley were smitten, and the barley was in the ear, and the flax was in the bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not smitten, for they were not grown up. And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, and spread abroad his hands unto the Lord, and the thunders and hail ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. And Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased. He sinned yet more, and hardened his heart, he and his servants. And the heart of the Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Strange guy. Can you imagine... Can you imagine seeing these natural calamities forecast, then happening, singling out his own people, not the Hebrew slaves, and have them stopped at the command of their leader, and still to dig in his heels and say, no way. Strange, strange. Now we get into a um, interesting, interesting one for many, many reasons. Chapter 10, verse 1. This is the plague of the locusts, and I think it's particularly fascinating, especially to students of prophecy. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him, that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt. Now we're beginning to get the clues, the echoes, because God is starting to focus their attention on carrying this on generation to generation. He's going to institute the tenth plague, a memorial that continues to this day. 
And uh, we're beginning to see the overtones of it here already. I tell thy sons, thy sons, sons, what things I have wrought in Egypt, my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know that I am the Lord. And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy border. And they shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth. I don't know if you've ever been out in the desert with the uh, cockroaches especially at night if you stop for gas and the light of course tracks them all and you think it's dark asphalt until you realize they're just cockroaches attracted by the light it's a strange strange feeling um, people that live out there get used to them that's the part that's even stranger <laughs> and they shall cover the face of the earth verse 5 that one cannot, uh, cannot be able to see the earth and they shall eat the residue of that which is escaped which remaineth unto you from the hail and shall eat every tree which groweth up for you out of the field and they shall fill thy houses, and the houses of all thy servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither thy fathers nor thy father's fathers have seen since the day that they were upon the earth unto this day. And he returned himself and went out from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall go? Moses said, We will go with our young, and with our old, with our sons, and with our daughters, with our flocks, and with our herds we will go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be with you, as I will let you go, and your little ones look to it, for evil is before you. Not so, go now ye that are men, and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up out of the land of Egypt, and eat every herb of the, of the land, even all that the hail hath left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. That's interesting. Where did the locusts come from then? The east, huh? And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the borders of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. So these are very special kind of locusts, apparently. For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened. And they did eat every herb of the land, and they all the fruit of the trees which the hail hath left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees, nor in the herbs of the field, through all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste, and he said to them, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once. And entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. And he went from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. And there remained not one locust in all the borders of Egypt. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. We'll go to another plague here in a minute. Interesting, interesting plague, these locusts. Now, uh, these are particularly interesting. If we turn to, I believe it's Revelation chapter 9, you'll find another plague of locusts that the one in Exodus may be simply a foreshadowing of, in a typological sense at least, this particular bunch of locusts come out of the bottomless pit. Verse 3, And there came up out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor either any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And it goes on to describe them. Now, what's interesting about these, you can spend a lot of time studying locusts, and I won't take it all here in, in detail, but there is a couple of things that I think are kind of interesting about locusts. If we get over here, we notice verse 11. It describes these locusts, verse 7, the shapes of the locusts were like horses preparing them to battle. Their heads were, as it were, crowns were like gold, their faces like faces of men, and on it goes. Verse um, 11 says, And they had a king over them, that the locusts have a king over them, who is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue is Apollyon, meaning destroyer. Okay. One woe is passed before two more woes are coming. 
Now, what's fascinating to me, if you turn to Proverbs 30, verse 27, the locusts have no king, yet go they forth, all of them, by bands. Now, you can obviously read the book of Proverbs, and you can go a long way without worrying too much about the fact that locusts don't have a king, right? <laughs> On the other hand, it's my suggestion to you, the Holy Spirit puts those little tidbits places that he expects you to find on your travels to discover that in Revelation chapter 9, what they're talking about locusts there are not any normal kind of locusts. And out of that, you can build a whole study out of, of what's really going on in the book of Revelation. But the idiom that the Holy Spirit's dealing in is locusts. And of course, patterned after, in a sense, idiomatically speaking, the plagues of locusts in the book of Exodus. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's keep moving. We've gotten to chapter 10, verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand unto heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Now that's dark. I don't know how many of you ever had an experience where it was so dark you could feel the darkness. The implication is that it isn't just dark in the sense of being absolutely devoid of any light. It's something deeper than that. It's a spiritual darkness. Those of you that have, may have had the misfortune to be in an experience of spiritual darkness may be able to relate to this verse perhaps more deeply than others of us can. Darkness which may be felt, it says verse 21. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. Three days. What was the highest of, in the Egyptian hierarchy of gods they worshipped? Ra. The highest god was Ra. The word Pharaoh actually is derived from the same word from which we get Ra. That is, it's tied to this idea of worshiping the sun, the source of light. The ultimate put-down of Egypt, after going through their whole Parthenon of idols, is to address the highest of their gods, Ra, the god of light. How does God deal with him? By plunging the land into darkness. They saw an not one another, neither rose from any, any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Most scholars presume that that was the Shekinah glory. It wasn't just light. It wasn't just that their lamps worked. There was something supernatural going on here. Just as this was a supernatural darkness, that was a supernatural light. And those of you that are interested in that subject can obviously know that we are children of the what? Light. Not of the darkness. And Paul has good news for you in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. For your children of the day, not of night. The day of the Lord comes like a thief of the night to whom? To those who dwell in darkness. Verse 4, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. If you understand Paul's message, you know that you should not really be caught by surprise with the Lord's appearing. You're all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober-minded. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that are drunk are drunk in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, and so forth. God has not appointed us to wrath, but and so forth. Very, very important passage. Now, I should comment a little bit on these um, three days of darkness. God withdrew his light from the land of Egypt. We know from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For God hath made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Who was made sin for us? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. He was actually made sin for us, right? Turn to Habakkuk chapter 1. That'll test whether or not you've got tabs on your Bible. <laughs> it's hard even with tabs, right? Habakkuk chapter 1. Be careful of the pages if they've never been opened before. Go slowly. <laughs> Verse 13 tells us something about the character of God. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Can God look upon evil? No. That's the reason that Jesus Christ, on the hanging on the cross, quoted Psalm 22, Verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God himself had to, for a period of time, alienate himself from his own son. He made his son sin on our behalf, but then could not look upon sin. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The exclamation of Jesus Christ from the cross, you can find the elaboration of that in Psalm 22. 
another kind of darkness, another kind of occasion. Taking that darkness so that we might have light. Okay, let's pick it up, verse 24, and then we can make some summary observations. Uh, verse 24, Pharaoh called unto Moses, said, uh, this is back to he, Exodus chapter uh, 10, verse 24, Pharaoh called unto Moses, said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Oh, let your flocks and your herds be left behind. Let your little ones go also with you. I was, you know, take your kids and get out of here. Leave your flocks. Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle shall also go with us. And there shall not be an hoof left behind. Not a single one. That's interesting. And therefore must we take to serve the Lord our God, and we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said unto them, Get thee from me, take heed to thyself, see my face no more, for in that day that thou seest my face, thou shalt die. Moses said, Thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again no more. Now, we will not jump into chapter 11. Next time we'll take chapter 11 and 12. But I'd like you to take a peek at chapter 12, verse 12, because it'll help you understand the nine plagues we've just read. God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Who is God judging? The gods of Egypt. So if you, read, if, you, if you go through a whole course of the nine things, you'll see a, a really a chronicle of the gods they worshipped. Now, a couple of other observations. I'd I think we've talked structurally how these things are organized. Let me go back and summarize the nine in the few moments we have and then talk about a couple of other things. Water turned to blood, frogs and lice. First group of three. The first two of those, water turned to blood and the frogs executed by the magicians. When we get to the lice, they cop out. Can't do any more. Then we have the flies, the disease on the cattle, the boils, and so forth. Then we have the thunder and hail, the locusts, and the darkness for three days, nine plagues. The first three, rod of Aaron prominent, the last three, the, uh, rod of the hand of Moses. The middle three, not much is said about that. Something else that's kind of interesting, not sure it's significant, it's just interesting. If you take the ten and lay them out, you discover that there's a strange introversion of these things, that is structurally. The first and the tenth relate to blood. Water turned to blood, blood on the doorpost and lintels, right? The um, frogs are night creatures, and we have the darkness for three days. We have the concept of darkness on both of those. The lice from the dust and the locusts. Uh, the next ones moving in are the um, thunder and the hail and the flies. In both cases, the land of Goshen is specifically mentioned. In the disease in the cattle and the boils and the sores and so forth, both of those are focusing on the beasts. I'm not sure what to conclude from this other than a suggestion to you that you might study these and discover that they are structurally attended to, the very structure in which the way they're presented, the subtlety of, of the description, appears to be significant. Let me take the time that we have and cover some other things. The purpose of the plagues, of course, would demonstrate the power of God, as mentioned in chapter 9, verse 16. Even the uh, Pharaoh's ministers themselves in chapter 8, verse 19, declared that this is the finger of God. The purpose of the plagues, of course, is to demonstrate God's wrath, we discovered in the 16th verse of chapter 10. There's certainly the judgment of the demons. Numbers chapter 33, verse 4, makes a specific reference to the fact that the demons in Egypt were judged. It also serves as a warning to the nations. This was told to Abraham in Genesis 12, verse 3. But even Rahab, when we get to Joshua, when Rahab meets Joshua, she says they had heard about all this that went on in Egypt, and they recognized that God was God. She may, gives testimony to that. The Philistines in 2 Samuel 4, 8 make a similar kind of remark. The word of what God did to the Egyptians got around town, and, and everybody was nervous about it. And of course, it was for testing Israel, as you find in Deuteronomy 4.33 and Exodus 15.11. Now, there's another interest we have, and that most of us here, frankly, I think are here because we're prophecy buffs. We uh, either have or in the middle of or probably will be studying the book of Revelation through the tapes or what have you. Our interest in Isaiah, Zechariah, Daniel, you name it, is from a prophecy orientation. Exodus is no different. Let me give you a few examples of parallels between the book of Exodus, what we've read so far, and the uh, plagues of Egypt. The Great Tribulation, as we speak of it in the New Testament, comes from Christ's quoting of, Ma of John, Daniel 12. The term in the Old Testament for the Great Tribulation 
is the time of Jacob's trouble. Israel will be sorely oppressed. Your references on that in Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 5 through 8, and Isaiah chapter 60, verse 14, for those of you that want to dig into that description. The Great Tribulation is a time of Israel's persecution and punishment. That obviously is analogous to what they were enduring in Egypt. Israel had to cry to God, and he will hear. And that's in Jeremiah 31, verses 18 through 20. It's also in Hosea 5 and 6, which I'll come back to in a minute. In both Exodus and the book of Revelation, we have two witnesses sent, Moses being one of them. And we see these two witnesses do miracles. That's recorded in Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 through 6. And of the four miracles, two are those that are uniquely done by Elijah and two are done uniquely by Moses. And they're certainly identifiers, if you will, in some sense, in, the, in Revelation 11. The enemies of God in both books do miracles. Revelation 13 is full of that. The second beast of Revelation 13 conspicuously does miracles, even, even uh, uh, doing a simulated resurrection. God will execute sore judgments upon the world, we know from Jeremiah 25, and also from Revelation chapter 6 through 19, the whole chronicle that most people characterize the book by, is that issue. During this period, God will protect his people from these judgments, as we see in Revelation chapter 7, 12, and chapters 14, 15, and 16 in the book of Revelation. Water will specifically be turned to blood in Revelation chapter 8, verse 8, and Revelation chapter 16, verses 4 and 5. Satanic frogs are to appear, we saw in Revelation 16, 13, which we looked up. A plague of locusts are sent in Revelation chapter 9, we looked that up. Boils also appear in the book of Revelation, Revelation 16, verse 2. Terrible hailstones of fire, Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. Darkness is specifically predicted, both in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2, Revelation chapter 16, 10. Their hearts are to be hardened, we discover in Revelation chapter 9, verse 20 and 21. There will be death on multitudes, we discover in Revelation chapter 9, verse 15. And of course, the key message in both chronicles is that Israel is delivered. And we see that in Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4, and Romans chapter 11, verse 26. The precondition we learn from the Zechariah study, and we get the clue from Hosea, verse 14 of chapter 5. God is saying, For I will be like unto Ephraim, like a lion, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take him away, and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place. Oh, really? That means you must have left it. I will go and return to my place. For how long? Until they acknowledge their offense. What's their offense? Israel's offense. Rejecting their Messiah. In their affliction, they shall see me early. And here's the prayer that the nation Israel will officially declare to call Christ back. Verse 6, verse 1, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal us, he hath smitten, he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, and after the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then we shall know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as, in the, as the morning, and he shall come up unto us like the rain, the latter and former rain unto the earth, and so forth. Very interesting thing is that apparently some scholars believe at least, let me be more precise, some scholars view this passage plus some others. It all has to do with a careful study of the New Testament and recognize that Israel's sin was the rejection of her Messiah. And that occurred long before Calvary. That occurred in effect in Matthew chapter 12, thus giving rise to the 13 kingdom parables to the, 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 where the disciples are focusing on the church. And that offense, and incidentally in the Old Testament, we speak of healing their iniquity. Their iniquity is singular, not plural, singular. It's a specific iniquity we're talking about, and that is the rejection of their Messiah. And uh, it is their calling upon him that at least some scholars feel. We cover, if you're interested in the subject, we cover this, I believe, incident to the studies in Zechariah chapters 12, 13, and 14. For those of you that might want to... Uh, get into some of that. Next time we'll take Exodus chapter 11 and 12, the Passover, and it's um, a very, very exciting climax to what we've been building up to here. Let's bow our hearts with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you have been direct and open to us, that you have shown us that which you are about to do. We thank you, Father, for the record of Egypt. We thank you, Father, for its insight that you are a God that exalts your people over their enemies. We praise you, God, that you deal with your redeemed. 
And we thank you, Father, that you have shown us your mission on our behalf. We would ask you, Father, to give us insight from this view into today. Help us, Father, to be sensitive to the judgments that shall yet future come upon the earth. We would ask you, Father, to deal with each and every one of us in this room, that we might be conscious of your presence, that we be conscious that your word will be fulfilled, that all these promises will be fulfilled. We ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, to draw us closer to you. Help us, Father, be sensitive as your people to what you would have us do to prepare ourselves for those days. Help us, Father, to grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may indeed be delivered from these things which shall come to pass. For we ask this to his glory 